you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to 1 Samuel, chapter 14, 1 Samuel chapter 14, and I just want to say before we look at the scripture this morning that uh, you're not going to have any notes up on the screen, and that's totally my fault, uh, and there's a reason for it, actually, I'm not making excuse. But I'm preaching a message that I found rather hard to outline. Actually, I would like for you to look at the Scripture more than the screen this morning because I'm just going to be telling the story. So there may not be a lot of writing for you this morning. Hopefully you'll remember and hopefully you'll go back to the Scripture to review and remember. So you might want to make your notes in your Bible if there's any little things that you want to jot down. So it's not really... An outline, it's more of a story or narrative, so I just want you to follow along with me. And we're in chapter 14 of 1 Samuel. So we're going to do a little background study, look back, uh, the back story up to where we are. Stand with me in honor of the Word of God and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just two verses this morning, and I have a lot more to read, but we'll take time during the script, in the sermon to look at Scriptures. The Bible says, verse 1, Now it happened one day that Jonathan the son of Saul said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father, his father Saul, who is king. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Magron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. Enough read. Just keep that in your mind. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you would bless us to hear what we need at this moment in our life. And may we all walk out with the message that will encourage us and bless us to be lights in a world of darkness. So, Father, we look to your word, speak deeply to our hearts, convict us, let the message not leave us until it's in our practice, and we pray it. For your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Only two verses. The title and the topic, however, I will give you. It's motivation. That's what I want to talk about, motivation. Now listen very carefully. I've asked this just in case of emergencies. (laughs) Uh, Listen to what I I, I want to ask you a couple of questions for, for your life, your personal life. You're saved. Let's assume you are. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit is within you. And if that's the case, you're saved, and if you're saved, the Holy Spirit is within you. How is it that you can be so equipped, saved, God's child, and the Holy Spirit within you, and not be active in the business of the Lord? And I would say... Maybe a follow-up question to that would be, why aren't you motivated to serve the Lord? What would motivate you to serve the Lord? And that's just a really basic question, but I, I, I believe that question needs to be echoed throughout this country. So blessed of the Lord, uh, so uh, blessed to have the history of God's blessing in the past and And so many churches throughout this nation uh, who are free to do what so many other churches would love to have the freedom to do. And here we sit in our churches across this country with so much opportunity to be engaged and active in the work of the Lord. But very few people ever go to that level of active work or active Uh, participation in the work of the Lord. And I would say that possibly uh, it, it is a lack of motivation. Now, what should we do about that? Should I uh, invite some motivational speakers in to get us all motivated? It'll probably last uh, for a little bit of time, but that's not going to be the answer. And I do find in our text, just as I've read, there's one person who seems to be highly motivated, and that is Jonathan, and one person who doesn't seem to be motivated at all, and that's King Saul. 
And when you look at Saul, Saul had everything that you, you would expect a person to have in order to be about the work of the Lord. He was called of God to be the first king of Israel. He had uh, the support of the people, I guess, for the most part. Uh, he, had, he had at one time a rather larger army than he has now. We'll talk about some of that in just a minute. But with the title, with the anointing of God, with the power of God resting upon him as the king appointed by God, you would think that he would be highly motivated to be about the work of the Lord. But his son, who is not the king, he's just his son, Jonathan, is highly motivated in his service to the Lord. So I just want to talk about motivation just for a moment, and we won't stay here long. This is just one sermon we're moving on. I'm not doing a series on motivation, but it's important that you answer the question for yourself. Why am I not motivated to be active, engaged in the service of the Lord? What will it take? So let me just, uh, let me just spend a few moments talking about Saul's lack of motivation. His, here, let me just give you the back story so you know where we are. And some of you know it for you've been with us for weeks, but in the story at present in chapter 14, we read ahead, uh, Jonathan went on to the garrison, what he did last week, the teamwork between Jonathan and his armor bearer and the victory that God gave them. But in this scripture, it tells the beginning of that story, the one we covered last week, how that Jonathan just said to his armor bearer, let's go over to the Philistines. And so that's the beginning of the story we covered last week. We come back to cover the story of Saul who didn't go out. He didn't do anything except sit under a pomegranate tree in Magran. And he had 600, you might as well say bodyguards, because it really doesn't constitute an army in comparison to what waits outside uh, the, the uh, I guess, the parameters of his his, um, his place that he's, he's hiding out. I, I would assume that he's basically, he's acting more like a, 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 a possum. <laughs> he's, he's playing dead. He's not moving. He's not doing anything. Maybe if the enemy sees me inactive and not doing anything, they will go away and leave us alone. That just seems to be his strategy here. I'm just, uh, this is my territory. This is, this is where we are. My army's here. 600 men from 2,000 down to 600. We know all of that story. But let me just talk about why he may not be motivated and why you may not be motivated to serve the Lord. Let's, let's deal with some of the negatives, the lack of motivation. I would say, first of all, that Saul, when he became king, uh, had some opposition. Let's look back at that just for a moment in chapter 10. Chapter 10 and verse 27. Well, let's read a little bit above that. The Bible says, uh, and Samuel, let's look in 25 and read on into that. And Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty, talking about the prophet, talking about Saul, and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, and every man went to his house. And Saul went to his home in Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, whose heart God had touched. But some rebels said, how can this man save us? And so they despised him and brought him no presents, but he that is Saul, the king, held his peace. So we find Saul in chapter 14 sitting under a pomegranate tree, surrounded by 600 bodyguards. And what we may ask is, why would you, the king, empowered of God, chosen of God, be uh, in this place, lacking motivation to go out and engage the enemy, where your son, with only one person, not 600 bodyguards, but one armor bearer, goes out against them? What's the matter with you? And it could be that he has been disheartened by some of these men who did not want him to be the king. As a matter of fact, in his first victory, he had an opportunity in his first victory to take care of these people. Let me just read that to you. It says in chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, the people said to Samuel, who, who is he who said Saul shall not reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, no, not a man shall be put to death this day, for the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. So he had an opposition. They were willing to deal with the opposition. And he said, 
no, we're not going to do that. That was Saul, the king, said, we're not going to do that. So his opposition, I would say, therefore, lived on. Did they change their mind? Did they join those who had decided that Saul was worthy as a king? Well, if they, de- if they determined that he was worthy, this, was be- this would be the day to give Saul, the, I guess, the credit that he deserves as a king and, and well worthy to be that chosen of God. But according to the Scripture, Saul said, leave the opposition alone. We're not doing anything with them. And so by the time we get to chapter 14, it could be that the opposition still present has now spread and there's more people in the opposition camp. I don't know. Why would I believe that? I would believe that because Saul, as I said, is not doing anything surrounded by enemies, innumerable. According to the Scripture, the enemy that's outside his camp is of the number of the sands of the sea. That's what it looked like. He has 600 men. It's not a situation that you would say is just really great and fantastic. You have to have some people thinking, what's wrong with this king that he would allow us to get into this position surrounded by this number, or a number that can't be numbered, uh, of enemy, and we only have 600 people. How can he just sit under that tree over there? I'm sure there's a lot of room for criticism of Saul, and I'm sure the criticism doesn't help him. It just causes him to become more and more discouraged and therefore lacking motivation, right? Now, I know that we have a lot of people in here who've lived a lot of years of life. We've put us all together. We'd have a lot of years of life in this room. And I would imagine that you have gone through some times in your life where you needed encouragement to be motivated. Can I get a witness to that? Maybe some of you need that right now. Maybe you came here this morning for me to encourage you. And I hope that I am encouraging you by showing you why you lack motivation. You are discouraged. And maybe you are discouraged because someone is discouraging you and not encouraging you. You know, I, I, I believe, uh, and I hate to use uh, illustrations from sports uh, too much, but I, I do believe that sometimes when, the, when the, uh, the fans begin to die down in their support of the team, it does affect what happens on the field. How many of you believe that? When I, was, I only went to one LSU game. Where it was so quiet, I could hear people crumpling their hamburger paper three three rows down. I mean, it was just so quiet, and it was just so boring, and it was just I was ready for this game to be over, and I couldn't imagine how the players on the field felt because no one was doing anything. There was no support of the team. And Jonathan is going out and doing his own thing, and Saul is there, and he, he needs some encouragement. Maybe the opposition had taken its toll. I talk to people who say to me sometimes, I'm never going back to church because of something someone did to me. And that opposition or that whatever it was happened has put them down. Now, I think they need to be encouraged. I think they need to know that uh, Satan had it all planned out and they're allowing that to have its effect on them. But we have to understand that if we've been hurt Uh, someone's been hurt, it it needs to be known that this can work opposite of what we would hope would happen. That is, instead of someone coming behind to encourage you, you remain discouraged and eventually just fall out of service to the Lord altogether. How many people are out of church today because someone discouraged them? Someone did something to them. And I would like to say if they happen to be, and maybe they wouldn't even tune in uh, to anything on the internet and watch, watch a message. If they happen to be tuned in, I just want you to know that if you were hurt and someone caused you to feel like you should never go back to church, please listen to me. The enemy, Satan, would like for you to believe that for the rest of your life and never be engaged in the work of the ministry. You weren't saved and spirit-filled to stay out of church. You were saved to be part of the body of Christ, to hold your position in the body of Christ, to function with the body of Christ, and to pray and work toward the completion of the ministry of the church, which is the body of Christ. Would you all agree? Everybody say amen to those people who are listening. Amen. Amen. Just so they'll know, we want them back. Come back. Amen. Come here. 
We would like to encourage you there. But I'm going to say Saul, being the one person that everyone could blame for this situation, 600 men against how many, we don't know. I imagine he got a lot of opposition. The opposition lived by his own command, and they're there and may be growing in number. Another thing that I would like to say is that Saul really had a problem with his own self-worth. Let me just read this to you in chapter 14, verse 17. Chapter 14, verse 17. I'm sorry, I didn't mean 17. Chapter 14, verse 27. So I can get this right. I'm sorry. I'm doing exactly, never mind what I saw. Another preacher, I really, he couldn't find something in his Bible the other day, and he said, it's in the Bible, just wait, I'll find it. <laughs> Chapter 15 and verse 17 my 15, 14s together. This is what Samuel said to Saul, talking about Saul and where he was now. Uh, Verse 16, he says, Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, I'll tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. And so Samuel said, this is the prophet saying to Saul, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of... the tribes of Israel, and did you not, or did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? And so this says something to me that at the beginning, and we saw it quite clearly just through his action, that Saul didn't think a lot of his ability. He didn't think that he was worthy to be king, that he could qualify in any way to be king. He was, as the prophet says here, little in his own eyes. And that will keep you from being active and motivated to be active in the Lord's service when not only you have opposition telling you can't, but you already have in your own heart a feeling that you can't. I'm not qualified. I couldn't do that. Can I tell you something? The people God appoints to do things are never qualified at the point of appointment. God doesn't call the qualified. He calls those He will qualify. So, for example, we could look at many illustrations of that. Moses, for example, was to go and tell uh, the the Pharaoh that uh, he should let the people go. And and Moses said, I'm really not a good spokesman. I think you have the wrong person. I can't talk in front of people very well. But God qualified Moses to go. Paul was not really familiar that much with the ways and the life of, Uh, the lives of uh, the Gentiles. But when uh, God needed a preacher, an apostle to go to the Gentiles, he called Paul, who knew very little about Gentiles. He knew a lot more about Jews. Call me to preach to Jews. I know all about that. No, I don't want your ability. I just want your availability and I will qualify you. And so if you're saying someone hurt me, get over it and get back in the game. If you're saying I'm not qualified, just understand when you say I will, I'm willing, Lord, God will qualify you to do it. Don't allow those things to keep you from being motivated in the service of the Lord. But I'm going to tell you what I think really hit Saul hard, and it may be it's where you've landed. And we'll read it back in chapter 13. I have this one right, so you can look there with me. Chapter 13, verse 13. And this is back when Saul uh, had uh, these Philistines show up by the number we can't number. We just know that there were 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people coming with the army as the sand of the seashore, verse 5. But in chapter 13, Saul did something he was not supposed to do. He offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and when he did that, the prophet showed up. He was supposed to be there. He was not on time according to Saul's schedule. So he went ahead, Saul went ahead and did what he shouldn't have done. And the Bible says that Samuel, the prophet, showed up at that time after he had done this thing. And Samuel said to him in verse 13, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for him a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So maybe you have opposition. That makes you feel uh, that you really shouldn't be involved in the work of the Lord. You can't handle it. No motivation. Maybe you have uh, an ego problem, a self-worth. You don't have a high self-worth. You don't think you're qualified to do anything. But the thing here that I think really hit Saul hard, and maybe it's your problem, 
is failure and the fear of failure. He did something he should never, he should never have done when he offered these offerings. And then Samuel showed up and not only told him he had done foolishly, but explained to him now that there was a consequence. Your kingdom will not continue. It means basically when you die, it's all over with. There won't be another of your family sitting on the throne. Your sons will not become king after you. No dynasty. It's over. One term, one person, your family serving, and that's it. It's over. But it also in Saul's mind starts to play a picture. What would that look like? If my king, if my sons will not reign after me, does that mean we will all die together? Maybe when I die, they'll die so they couldn't reign after me. Uh, and therefore, is the battlefield a place we should never be found together? Because when I die, my sons will die as well. Is that, is that what he's thinking? That he is... He is guaranteed this failure again. He failed once, and now you're going to fail again because God already has your replacement picked out. He's a man after his own heart, and uh, you're going to have one term, and no one in your family serve after you. It's going to be over for you. Now, if you had received that kind of information and you were surrounded by enemies, would you feel like rushing the battlefield? No. His motivation was out the window. He just played dead and got under that tree, and he would never have given permission for Jonathan to go to the battlefield. You're not going to live to ruin after me, and so I don't want you going to the battlefield since I know that's never going to happen. I don't want you to die out there. It's not safe for you out there. He would have never given him permission to go to the battlefield. And by the way, we remember that Jonathan stirred all this up from the beginning by going out against the Philistines. That's why we have all these people out there beyond their camp. So this failure really hit Saul hard. And it's a, a failure that, that I think he just uh, he had a hard time with from this day forward. Somebody out there has already been chosen in God's, in God's plan to replace me. I have my replacement. He's living on earth somewhere today. I'm not going to have any son reign after me. And that failure just hit him to where I think it put him in neutral, and here he is sitting under a pomegranate tree with 600 bodyguards. So I want to ask you the question, is it opposition that keeps you from being active and motivated? Is it that you have little confidence in yourself? Is it that you have failed and you will not attempt and try again? And I'm encouraging you to deal with each of those because that's not a reason to not be active in the service of the Lord. You should put all of that away and say, listen, say this, I have no excuse for not being involved in God's work if I'm saved and filled with the Spirit. I must be motivated. Now, now, so we have to say what motivates you. We know what has discouraged you so you don't have motivation If we can put all of that in just a little circle over and say, I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to put all of that away in my life. I'm not going to worry about the opposition from this day forward. Yeah, right. Okay. Hopefully. Just recognize that's a weakness. Deal with it today and deal with it tomorrow and next week. Always deal with it. I'm not going to look small in my own eyes. I'm going to look at myself through Christ and realize I'm saved and filled with the Spirit and therefore I have every reason to be involved and engaged in the work of the Lord. And yes, I failed and I'm likely to fail again, but thank God there is grace and another opportunity to get up, to get up and go again. That's what we need. Get up and go again. So what's going to motivate you? Now, when Saul, listen, here's, here's the scripture we didn't read. Look at, look at uh, chapter 14. Let's read into the story here, on into the story. Jonathan had, man, Jonathan had all kinds of motivation. But I'm just going to tell you, Jonathan's motivation was just this. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. This is our land. They shouldn't be here. And God's going to run them out. So let's go charge Let's go charge this army, just the two of us, and God's going to take care of the consequences. (laughs) That's pretty bold. That's exactly what he did. Climbed that hill and went out 
after the Philistines, and in just no time, he and his armor bearer had taken out 20 men, and that stirred up fear in the camp of the enemy. We'll talk about that in a minute. But when Saul heard that, that the enemy, let me just look. I don't know how it looks in your Bible, but I'm just going to look at it. Before Jonathan went up there and fought those 20 men in the Philistine garrison, we have the army of God trembling, trembling. They're following Saul, the the followers of Saul. Chapter 13 and verse 7 says, And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. And as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all of the people followed, followed him trembling fearful. And that's where many of them started running away from Saul and his leadership and hiding themselves. They were fearful. It's the fear and the trembling and fear. But when Jonathan and his armor bearer took down 70, I mean 20, at one time, the Bible says that the camp of the enemy was trembling. Chapter 14 to verse 15. And there was trembling, this is the enemy now, trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. It wasn't just the soldiers trembling. Everyone was trembling. Why? Because they had witnessed something that had to be more than the power of man. So what I want you to see is what will motivate you. Now Saul could have said this. Let me just read on. So let's read this. In verse 15 of 14, and there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison, even the raiders, some of the hardest soldiers, trembled, and the earth quaked. And so it was a very great trembling. So let me read that again, verse 15 of chapter 14. And there was trembling in the camp. What is that? That's God at work. And there was trembling in the field. What's that? That's God at work. And there was trembling among the people. What's that? God at work. And the Bible says, and the garrison and the hardest soldiers trembled. What's that? God at work. And then the earth quaked. What's that? That's God at work. And the Bible says, and there was a very great trembling. Now the the watchman of Saul of Gibeah of Benjamin, in Gibeah of Benjamin, looked And there was a multitude, that is that big, huge, innumerable foe out there, all the enemy out there is melting away. That's the New King James. I don't know what you have in your translation. Melting away. I kind of like that. Changing before your very eyes. That's how you see melting, something that's solid, and all of a sudden it becomes liquid, and then it's not even there. It's melting away. It's changing before their very eyes. Everything out there... Big, huge groups of of enemies, the enemy all over the place, but it's kind of melting away. The the field, the battlefield is changing uh, as they look at it. And and the thing is, the Bible says a watchman of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked and there was a multitude melting away and they went here and there. That's very important. Uh, They went here and there. Now, if, uh, if we had something happen in this room this morning and the problem was over there, which way are you going to run if the problem's over there? No, you're not going to run that way. That's the problem. What you're going to do? You're going to run this way because the problem's there. But if you did run that way and that way and that way and that way, where's the problem? It's everywhere. When the Bible says that they went this way and that way, basically what you're what you're seeing is that that the, the enemy is the enemy is attacking itself. There's no place to run. Everywhere you turn, there's a problem. How do you run from that? You run in every direction. People are going every direction. Why? Because that's God. I'll come back to that in just a moment. But the Bible says that when they reported that to Saul, uh, you know, under the pomegranate tree, resting, relaxing, playing possum, (laughs) guess what's happening out in the battlefield? I don't know. They're melting away. The enemy's running all over the field in every direction as though something's happening all around them. 
Oh, I've heard about that before. By the way, before we go into that, call the roll and see, see who may be out there. Maybe somebody's out there stirring all this up. And so they call the roll, and of course, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And the Bible says, And Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God, for at that time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. And it happened that as Saul talked to the priest, trying to get a word from God so he'll know what to do. He's already messed up one time. I don't want to do the wrong thing. Tell me what to do. And as he was talking with the priest, verse 19, the Bible says that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. It got louder and louder so that Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. In other words, I don't need you to give me an answer what to do. I know what I need to do. I've heard this before. I've heard this before. And, and basically, it's not that he's not waiting on the answer of God necessarily. It's like God is already doing something, and I know what to do when God is already doing something. You join what God is doing. You don't have to ask, should I join what God's doing? When you hear something, and you know something, and you've seen something like what you're hearing, and you know, then you join that, and you go after that. I don't need you to tell me, I already got that, so l- let's just stop. And I'm going to get the people, and we're going to assemble, and we're going to go to the battlefield. But before we go to the battlefield with Saul, listen very very carefully. I want you to hear this. One of the things that motivated Saul, no doubt, to go to the battlefield, if he had not heard anything more of the increase of the army, Saul would have said, hey, my son is out there by himself. I'm going And that would have been a personal motivation to be active. Sometimes we are active because we have personal motivations. There's something personal in our heart and our spirit about being active and involved. For Saul, it would have been, Jonathan, I'm going out there in the battlefield to rescue my son. I'm going to do this for my family, maybe. I'm doing this for my family. I'm going to get involved and engaged in the work of the Lord for my family. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe it wasn't personal. It may have been pride. He may have said, Jonathan's out there. I'm the king. He's my son. I'm the one that should be out there. Because he knows that the enemy is falling apart. I should be out there leading this. I shouldn't be back here under the pomegranate tree. Well, welcome to the world. I'm glad you woke up. Your position was not under the palm granite tree. Your position was out there in the battlefield. And when he realized that God was doing something and he was missing out on it, maybe that was the reason. I've got to get out there and be involved with what I have heard and seen before. I've seen this happen before. But let me just say this. I think the power of God was the greatest motivation for Saul to get out to the battlefield. As I said, he had seen, he had heard this before. This is not the first time, and it will not be the last time, that God works this way. When His, in, when his army is outnumbered, just, I mean, just massively outnumbered, God has done this before, and He will do this again. The swords that destroyed Philistines that day were not Hebrew swords. Matter of fact, we were told in the latter part of the chapter before this that there were only two people that really had swords and shields. That was Jonathan and the king. Everybody else was fighting with whatever they could find. And so this massive army, imagine this, this massive army that we can't even number with shields, with chariots, with armor, with everything, is facing Saul and his 600 men. It's over before it ever even starts, we think. But Jonathan says, no, I remember that God can save by few or by many. Let's go out and and prove that we have faith in that. Climbed the hill, got up to the top, took out 20, and that caused the trembling to start in the camp of the Philistines. (laughs) And then what? Then the earth quaked. And then what? And then the minds of the enemy. And this has happened before and it will happen again, become so confused that they don't know where their enemy really is. And they start fighting one another so that the Philistines that fell that day 
fell by Philistine swords. <laughs> now you see why they're running everywhere, because everywhere they turned, there was a Philistine sword that's liable to end their life. If everybody in here all of a sudden became enemies of one another, this would be pandemonium. And you would look for a place to get out, but you would know no matter which direction you looked, you would have to face a number of people before you got out the door. And that's what happened. I don't have time to read this to you, but I ask you to read it sometime for yourself. Over in uh, Second Chronicles, you'll find the story of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat... Okay, I'll read it. You wanted me to read it, so I'll read it for you. Jehoshaphat was outnumbered just like Saul. He didn't have a chance because the people of Moab and Ammon and Mount Seir uh, beside the Ammonites came against him to battle in chapter 20 of Second Chronicles. And I want you to read it sometime at your leisure. I don't have to, time to read all of it. But basically what Jehoshaphat said is, we do not have any might against this company that has come against us as he prayed before the, uh, the Lord and all of the people were praying and, and fasting with him. We don't have any might against this great multitude. And then God answered him, his prayer, in verse 15 of Second Chronicles 20. And he said, listen, all of you, of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of the great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. And all of us could live with a lot more peace in our life if that teaching would just settle in our heart. It's never about me. It's not about my defense. It's not about my ability. This is God's battle, and he will take care of it. How many of you believe that? It's all throughout the Bible we see that. But here's what God goes on to say to Jehoshaphat. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. And do not fear, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Kohites stood up to praise the Lord, God of Israel, with a loud uh, with voices loud and high. And so they rose early in the morning, went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O men of, Jeru of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe the Lord your God, and so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall pro prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and whose praise should sing to the beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the army, saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. <laughs> How about that? So that when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were dead bodies fallen on the earth, and none escaped. I'm glad you brought so many we can't number, Philistines. Thank you very much, because that's how many it will take to take you out. I'm glad you brought all the spears and the swords, because that's the weapons we need to take you out. So when God starts to work, and we know how He works... These people will be running everywhere trying to get away from one another, and none of them will, will escape. <laughs> it happened again, is what I'm saying, in the history of the kings. It happened before. How many of the uh, Egyptian army did uh, Moses and all the children of Israel at the Red Sea raise a sword against? What did they do? They sat on the beach and watched, watched the show. <laughs> And by the way, that story was told for 40 years so that when they came to Jericho, the inhabitants of Jericho were still shaking in their boots that the God who defeated the Egyptian army has now come to Jericho. What does that mean? It just means this, and I want you to listen very carefully. The power of God should be attracting God's people 
in the battle. And that should be the motivation. We see and know that God will fight our battles for us, and we believe that the power of God is going to be with us to the accomplishment of His mission. And I'm just going to join God in what He's doing. And He's not going to depend on my power and my strength. He's going to do it all for Himself and for His glory. But He wants me there to be a part of it, to see it, to witness it. And that's exactly what happened in Samuel Saul took the people to the show, basically. They went and saw what happened. They, all the enemy down there had lost their mind, it seemed. They were just fighting one another and leaving their swords and their armor. And these people who had come to the battle with, with farming tools now could go down on the battlefield and have an armory like they never imagined because there's swords everywhere and there's shields everywhere and there's chariots everywhere. Now, wow. So the next time we see them in battle, they have swords and shields. and Why? Because God gave them an armory. You don't have any armor? Well, we'll take care of that. What am I saying? God gave not only a victory, God gave them a story. This is how God works. See, there's no reason for us to fear, no reason for us to worry, no reason for us to withdraw. There's no reason for us to find a pomegranate tree. There's only reason for us to stand up and rush toward the battlefield and say, God, for your glory, do it again, and he will. We're going to come to the story, so I won't spoil it by preaching it this morning. But we're going to come to the story where a little shepherd boy goes out, young shepherd boy goes out, young man, with five stones against a giant. You know the story very well. But what he says is exactly what we're reading about here, what motivated him. You come and defy the armies of the God of Israel. That's not acceptable. And today, not I, but God will deliver you into my hand. What I'm trying to tell you is we are absolutely assured of victory. Why aren't we motivated to be engaged? So... You may have personal reasons, there may be prideful reasons, but the real reason you should be motivated is the power of God is awaiting your service. So let me bow with you and pray with you. I really would like for you to think this morning about appearing before God right now, this very moment, What would you say to God about your participation or lack thereof in the ministry? In spreading the gospel, sharing the love of Christ with others, what would you say about that when you face God? Right now, you face Him right now. And if you would say, well, I I wasn't engaged and I had my different reasons and my lack of motivation was for this reason and that reason, and then you realize right then and there, that he had pledged his power to all of his promises, and they were yours, yea and amen, in Christ Jesus. He wanted you to be actively engaged in sharing Christ with this lost world, and you found a nice, comfortable place to rest. You say, well, I certainly wouldn't want to face God with that testimony. Well, thank God that this is a day that can change. I'm going to ask each of you to pray. God, Show me, according to your word, how that I'm guaranteed to be more than a conqueror through Christ and that I have nothing to look forward to except victory as I participate in sharing the gospel with others, loving people with the love of the Lord, have nothing but victory awaiting me and your power motivating me. And if that would be your prayer, your life will change. And you'll join the numbers who see God do great things for His glory as you yield to His service. Let me pray with you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, because we're so blessed with Bibles all over our homes, we're so blessed to have the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we're so blessed to be Your children and to have the promise of victory. And Father, why would we not serve 
Awaken us each morning with the excitement that we are yours. We're on, serve, we're on a mission for your glory. We're in service to you. And you've promised that when we would speak in your name, you would glorify your name. You would spread your word. You would do it. And you promised according to the great commission that you would be with us always, Lord, even to the end of the age. So, Lord, help us to walk out of this place putting aside all the negative things that would discourage us and picking up the things that we know will encourage us to be active and to be our motivation in going forward in service. Help us to do so even today by blessing one another, encouraging one another to be actively engaged. And Father, I pray for those who don't even know what we're talking about in here today. They just came with somebody or came to see what it was all about, and they're here. Maybe they're listening in, and they don't know what we're talking about. Father, I pray that you would show them today how much you love them, how much you want to forgive them of all their sins through Jesus Christ, and how that you want them to be your very own. And Lord, I pray today conviction would settle in their heart, and they would cry out to you for forgiveness and for salvation and know the joy and privilege of being filled with the Spirit and about your work. So, Lord, do what only you can do as we look to you and trust you. And, Father, I pray this would be a change, a day of change for everyone here for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to Loving Christ, the media ministry of New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. If we can minister to you somehow, please call us at area code 225-664-0858. Until next time, get into the Word of God and stay there. This has been a production of New Covenant Church, all rights reserved.